dodgy earth connection do not remove. It's already been removed. So somebody's been here and installed an earth rod, not very well. So what are we here to do? To clean up somebody's mess again. Lee and Luke are gonna be changing this over because somebody put this earth rod in for the Tesla Powerwall so that it could run off a backup gateway on island mode, but they connected it with this rubbish little plastic box and it's just snapped off. So we've got a proper earth pit to put in. Lee and Luke are gonna do that. I'm gonna show you some intriguing stuff about Tesla Powerwalls. I'm gonna show you what's inside this meter box. So all that coming up in today's video, smash a like, subscribe, let's go. So under here should be a nice neat earth connection and the reason you need an earth rod for Tesla power walls is because they are capable of taking the whole house into island mode essentially and when they do that they clamp the neutral and main earth together and you need an earth rod to provide the earth for the whole house. So that's the connection but look they've, they've crimped it like that and it's just snapped off because they've left it proud and it should really be deeper than that and it should be in a proper pit so we're going to have to dig out a proper pit hammer this down into the ground properly crimp a new lug on but i'll show you something interesting i asked the customer how did they get this you know 10 mil earth from here to the consumer unit when they did the power wall and he said oh they just reused the old bonding connection and i said boy what do you mean he said look at this so Customers had a heat pump installed and they've removed the gas supply to the property. So this was the gas bond, which was already there going back to the consumer unit. They've just literally cut that off and then just used that as the earth rod instead, because obviously this now is not extraneous and therefore it doesn't need bonding. So quite a nifty way of doing it, I thought, rather than having to run an earth cable across to the other side of the house to the consumer unit. Let me know in the comments what you think. Would you have done it that way or would you have done it differently? Ask a question. Ask a question, yeah. Is 10 mil one up? Yes, uh, that is a good question though. Is 10 mil enough for an earth electrode? What do you think? What would your answer be, Lee? I mean, I would have thought it would be 16 if usually it's a 16 off of like a normal earthing supply for like 100 amps. So what does the on-site guide say? <laughs> Luke's good at the on-site no, guide. No, no, you can, you can do this one. You do this one. I don't have one, so. Let me get my on-site guide out and I'll show you. So if we look at earthing arrangements, we'll see in terms of the size, like you say, you might I think. I guess the earthing, when it goes onto that earth, it's not going to be on the fuse, is it? It's going to be from the battery storage. Yeah, so that's one, that's one thing to, to think about. What, the other thing to think about is what is the maximum uh, ZE for a TT system. 200. So what is, if, if you've got 200 ohms, how much power is going to be able to actually flow in the event of a fault? That's a question. That's a question. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Well, I mean, 200 ohms is quite a lot of resistance, isn't it? ZE yeah. is, say, 0.35 and your PFC is like point. It's like something. might be one kilo, one thousand amps or something, yeah, yeah. right? So if you ramp that up to two hundred ohms, you can just do it through an ohms law calculator. It's resistance two hundred ohms, maximum current that can flow one point one amps. If you've got a two hundred ohm resistance on an earth rod, one one point one amps. But would you even need a ten? No, probably not. No. So if we look at the regs, I know it off the top of my head, but I want to show you where it says it. It's good to know if, the future, um, if we install them, we can just get rid of the gas pond. Yeah. <laughs> so if we look at these, the earthing arrangements, uh, figure 2.1, it shows a TT earthing arrangement. And then here it says, see table 4.4 for further information regarding the sizing of the earthing conductor for a TT earthing arrangement. If it's unprotected, so that means it's bare copper, yeah. it should be 25 mil. If it's buried but it's protected against corrosion so that means it's like insulated like that yeah. it should be 16 if it's protected against corrosion and mechanical damage 2.5 so that'd be if it's buried but it's in conduit yeah. or something like that if it's not buried it can be 4 mil or 2.5 if it's protected against so mechanical that damage that should be 16 then? so i would say Part buried and part it kind of looks like it's part buried, doesn't it? And then the rest probably goes under the floorboards, I'd imagine. Yeah. 
But in terms of the actual current carrying capacity, it oh, only yeah. needs to be 2.5 because that's such a small amount of fault current that could actually um, travel through it. So, so what was the interesting to see. So I would say real, real, fine, realistically, then. this is fine. Yeah. You know, um, the only reason it, I guess it needs to be so thick when it's buried is just to stop you going through it with a spade. If you, you know, if you hit that with a spade, it's not going to cut all the way through. Yeah. Whereas if it's 2.5, it probably would, wouldn't it? So this is Tesla Power Wall. It's about a 10 kilowatt hour battery. You know, it's pretty chunky as you can see. Tesla Power Walls are probably one of the best on the market in terms of price per kilowatt hour, but also they've got the backup gateway which enables you to basically run the whole house off of the backup battery in the event of a power cut. So it will instantly switch over to backup power and you won't lose, like your computer won't switch off, your router won't switch off, everything. It's very, very clever but there is like a two year lead time on these at the moment, which is why I like, we would love to be able to buy and install these for customers, but it, most people can't wait that long. But how it works is it's basically just got a supply cable from the consumer unit. I think it's on a four mil armored from the board on a 32 amp breaker. And then, okay, this is, so this oh, is connections CT connections. I don't know what that is actually. That cable, it goes all the way around to this box here. There's more connections in that box, oh, and then it goes it. all the way up the copex into that loft with the solar. So this is probably not the conventional way of doing a Tesla power wall. <laughs> what they've done, on the inverter, you have obviously the DC cables from the solar panels go into the inverter, but you can also have DC cables coming from the battery into the inverter as well. Yeah so that you can essentially, it's what we call a DC coupled system. So the DC from the solar panels can come straight in and charge the battery. And you don't have to convert it from DC to AC and then back to AC to DC, straight. it's going straight in. Um, that is a more efficient way to do a battery storage system. And then I think the battery is do, will do the conversion from, from the DC in the battery back to AC and send that back to the consumer unit, I think. But I'll check with the customer because he knows more about this system than I do, actually. That's, that's so it's, it's, it's a bit complicated. He's install it himself. So let's have a look in here and this should help us hopefully to, un oh my goodness. <gasps> oh, wow, that is a mess. Whoever Tesla Powerwall installer did this, not that impressed. Um, I mean, that is a complete mess. Right, so this is the flexi conduit that goes over to the battery. And then it looks like the armoureds, actually, they've looped them through here. Such a weird way of doing it. But you've got live neutron CPC going up in singles up to the loft, I think. And that's probably to the DB where this whole lot is fed from, because there is a DB in the loft. Is another set of singles. So there's actually two circuits in singles in here. This, these ones go to this armoured cable, which presumably does the zappy. And then this data cable basically is just connected on to this other data cable, which goes in the flexicon, which goes over to that other box. It's quite a mess. I suppose they've just done it this way rather than running two cables from the loft. They thought it'd be neater to just do it like this which I guess it kind of is quite neat, but it's just a bit of a weird way of doing it, isn't it? I'm just speaking quietly because there's a baby asleep upstairs, so we need to be a little bit quiet. But um, in here, this is the Tesla gateway. So this is basically where the tails come in from the mains. They go through this and then out to the consumer units. And I think you can have um, you can have a backup consumer unit essentially, which is run from the Tesla Powerwall. But this basically is the brain that does the switching. So it's got kind of a contactor in it. And in the event of a power cut, it instantly switches over. And then what it does, which is why the earth rod's important, is it clamps the neutral down to the earth rod. It basically creates its own PME system off of the earth rod rather than off of the supply earth to the property because what you don't want is earth leakage feeding back or things like that because it's a pme system anyway if the neutral drops out then the earth drops out isn't it so that's why 
you don't want the neutral from the supply having dangerous currents flowing back down it. To be honest, I don't understand it that much, as you can tell. So let me know in the comments if you know loads about these, let me know, um, because it'd be really interesting to hear exactly how it works from somebody who's an expert, but I just think it's really cool tech anyway, and it's, it's interesting to see it in real life. So the reason the customers got us looking at this, we're not just looking out of curiosity, it is because they've asked for a second power wall to be installed and we need to kind of just figure out whether it's actually doable to do that or not. Here is the solar edge inverter, which is, let's have a look, five kilowatt inverter. So that is taking the DC power from the panels, converting it into AC, feeding it back into the electrical system. This is a consumer unit dedicated for these various things. So you've got a heat pump, hydraulic station, DHW pump slash socket, solar PV and battery. And they're all on a type A RCD. So it looks like the DC cables from the solar panels come in here. And then these are the ones that go to the battery. So if we take this cover off. <gasps> oh, look at that. This is a complete mess. As you can see, a lot of tangled CT wires with AC cables and DC cables. Uh, it's not the nicest install. So Luke's already removed that. I mean, we might just take that off just for looks. We'll undo that, take this off, clear all that area and dig down enough for that to go in. And we might have to just drill a hole with a stuffing gland and bring the cable in the side because there's not much length on it. Oh, yeah, there is. <laughs> Imagine if it's not connected, it just pulls out. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's all right then. This is how good the airpods in. <laughs> Before it was in that and it wasn't even sunk into the ground so it was all wobbling about and that's how it got snapped before. So now that's actually going to be buried in the ground. If you need to get to the airpods you can just lift the lid off and access it easy. So having looked at the system and everything, it looks like it should be fairly easy to add another power wall to this system, which is great. So I'm going to get in touch with Sam from Oval and see if he fancies helping us to do a second Tesla power wall at this property. Um, so stay tuned for that. But now I'll hand you over to Lee and Luke while they finish off the earth rod. All right, so I'm going to pretend that's the earth rod, just this bit. So if you've not got the special attachment that goes on the end of the SDS and hammers it down, you can get one of these sort of attachments and put a socket on, just a socket that's big enough to go over. And as long as you've got a attachment that goes into your SDS with a chuck on the end, you can tighten that on and you can just hammer the rod down that way. But unfortunately I left mine at home. So we just had to go with a lump hammer today. This was the same lug that was on it. Yeah. I just have a different set, 16 to... That's, that was on a 16 before, uh, and this, I don't think, I'm not sure if I've got a 10, it's got a hole big enough. Earth pits in, as you can see, it's a lot better than what was previously there with re-hammered the rod down so that's a nice firm um, fixing because before we just pulled it straight out so um, all connected nice with some heat shrink all right we forgot to get a read in before to see what the difference is but now that we've re-put the earth rod in we're just going to go get a ZE from the board with it connected to this rod and see what reading we get so um, yeah hopefully well under 200 ohms same as if you're doing a normal ZE and you've got your live on your incomer and your earth on the earth of the main cutout, but obviously we're doing it to the earth rod. So our earth goes to the R2 lead and that goes all the way around to the earth rod and we're gonna get the reading to that. So this lead goes all the way around and is clamped onto the earth rod. This onto the live. One point zero one ohms. I'm happy with that. All right, thanks for watching guys. It's been a bit of a short one, like this earth rod. 
Hopefully you managed to see something interesting with Jordan talking about the power wall. And yeah, hopefully in the future you'll see us come back and fit another one. Me and Luca have got a, another little job to do on the way home. So we're going to get the tools in the van and go to that and we'll see you next time.